Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think we're ready to get going. So just give me one sec. Okay, so oh, yeah, hello, sure. welcome to this <clears throat> Hyperledger Sweden meetup. My name is Roland and I'm uh, your guest for today's session. <clears throat> Today we have a we have a guest speaker and uh, Antonio Lusardi from Dame, and he will give us an introduction to the Dame language, and he will show us also how we can use Dame in the world of Fabric and uh, maybe in the world of Sawtooth. And uh, yeah, this is an open session. I call this open session. And uh, that means that everybody who is interested in give a talk to the topic, to hyperledger related topics can reach me. And uh, then uh, we can find a uh, meetup term in and then you can present um, your pr project or on something what you, what you learn. And so, yeah. And, uh, and today I am happy to introduce uh, Antonio Lusardi and uh, he will give us an introduction to the world of Dhamma. Okay, yeah. so um, if you're ready, then you can start, Antonio. Thank you, Roland. Uh, yeah, first, big, big thank you to Roland for helping put this together and for giving me time to present on DAML. Um, I think it's a really cool language, so really excited to, to be presenting. And thank you very much for putting this together. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background on myself. My name is Andrew Lusardi, and I've been a developer advocate at Digital Asset who produces the open source language DAML for the last year now. Um, just came up on my one year anniversary about a week ago. And yeah, you know, I've just been interested in this space for a really long time. Uh, I am kind of a diehard Bitcoiner too on the side in the public space, but I think that DAML itself is a very interesting language for the more private distributed ledger uh, space in, in this whole very broad ecosystem. So today I'm going to be re presenting a few things. We're going to start with a presentation that's basically going to say, you know, kind of why would you want to use DAML? Uh, in what cases would you? And kind of like, what is it really? And then I'll be deploying DAML live on multiple infrastructures, all run locally, of course, uh, on Fabric and Sawtooth. And then we'll have time for questions at the end. But if you have any questions while I'm going through this, if anything isn't clear, you know, you can always feel free to interrupt me. I really don't mind. And yeah, so let's get started. So the first question I have here is basically, you know, don't we already have all the programming languages we need? Um, we have quite a few that will run on blockchains and distributed ledgers. And then we also have so many languages in this world. Why one more? And really, my answer is we don't. And the reason that I say this is because we have a lot of languages that kind of do the same things in different ways. All our languages that we work with today are largely imperative. Uh, all of them are largely class-based. And they do have niceties. So for example, like if I were to write in Go, I could probably, you know, get up and go faster than I could in some other languages. Or if I were to write in Java, I could produce very well architected programs. But ultimately, they're doing a lot of the same things in different ways. And when it comes to blockchains and distributed ledgers, uh, our languages currently behave a lot like these contemporary languages, and in many cases, actually are the contemporary languages. So on Fabric, for example, uh, you know, the languages are Java and Go, and I think Node.js uh, runs in chain code now as well, and there, I think there's one more. Um, but the blockchains and distributed ledgers that we're using, really their concerns aren't the same, because when you think about it, if you write a traditional program, you know, you get the ability to basically you're in full control of the state, you know, you write to your SQL database, whatever you want, and you can change it whenever you want, and you can even roll it back in time. And a lot of these fairly common things, uh, when a lot of people come into this space and try to write programs, they realize that they can't do these things. And the reason they can't do these things is because that's not the way that our data persistence layers are really designed here. And so I think we should have languages that kind of help, uh, you know, encapsulate this. And thus, by encapsulating it, we'll make our lives a little bit easier. 
Uh, so demo really differs in what it does here, and I'm going to go into that a bit. I'm also going to show, I should have mentioned, some source code during, uh, right after this presentation and before I actually deploy it. Uh, so what is DAML? You know, I'm on slide six already. Just let's get to the point. What does DAML do? And DAML is basically a portable language for distributed ledgers and really a lot of databases, but it's designed for distributed ledgers. And so what I mean by that is that DAML is a language that is really centered around this idea of you have a state and then you update it and the language itself handles a lot of things for you. So this actually that you're seeing on screen now is code that I'm going to go through in a little bit. Um, but just to give you a taste, this is kind of what it looks like and how it's structured. And what this structure does is it enables the DAML driver and various DAML components to know a lot about your program without you having to be very explicit about it. So with this code here, demo has encapsulated all the business logic that we need. Um, it's kept track of read, write, and execute permissions, which are actually fairly similar to the way that Unix does it. We even had one of my coworkers actually wrote a blog post on this uh, that I thought was a, a really good point. And it also knows how to store the data, all without somebody having to tell it. And so, it still powers front ends, though, that kind of look like any regular front end. Here's the actual Vue.js code, uh, all copied and pasted to a slide, just to drive home the point. And you also get a lot of niceties out of this. So going back here, you not only get your data persistence, you'll also get your JSON API. You'll get every way you're going to interact with your uh, back end, uh, with your front end, basically for free. And so you can think about demo really as a consistent language for distributed and relational databases. If you're programming, you can think about it as reducing complexity when you're developing these applications. If you know, you're architecting an application or you're doing project management on an application. And if you're a decision maker or really anybody, uh, it really does result in faster development of distributed applications. You can get up and going really quick in demo, and you can do it without worrying about which backend you're going to deploy to. You can go ahead, start writing your demo, start iterating, and decide whether you're deploying to Fabric or Sawtooth, or eventually we'll have support for Besu um, whenever you're ready. So in short, Demo is one of the first high-level smart contract languages. I won't say the first because who knows uh, for this for these particular platforms um, with quite a lot of classes of bugs eliminated. Demo is actually itself based on Haskell. So if you are interested in functional programming, even though Demo, in my opinion, is fairly much easier to write and understand, uh, there's obviously from doing that we get quite a lot of these niceties where we get a lot less runtime bugs. And if we have a bug in our code, a lot of them end up as compile time errors, which is also great. Uh, and it's also adaptive to changing requirements and needs throughout the entire project lifecycle. So basically, you know, if you need to change one of your demo models, um, it's generally not very complicated. And because everything is so well permissioned, when you go and start changing things, if you've changed something that something else depends on and you haven't updated the other dependency, well, it's going to immediately error at compile time uh, for pretty much every case. And it's also, you know, like I mentioned earlier, very ideal for transitioning from rapid prototyping through to production deployment. Uh, Prototyping, it's quite quick in, and you'll see people on our forums who are regularly prototyping their, their ideas in DAML. And then even in production, um, DAML is being developed and deployed at Australian Stock Exchange, at Hong Kong Exchange, and a bunch of healthcare and other financial applications. And hopefully, I think uh, it should be deployed in uh, a variety of different applications. And there's Quite a lot of others working on demo stuff too, but I can never remember who I can and can't talk about. So just take my word on that. And so now I kind of need to 
you know, prove everything I said. So we're going to check out my toy production app now. It's called Obeer. It basically is a way to record on a distributed ledger who owes who a beer, who has an obligation to who. And then we're going to deploy it on Fabric and Sawtooth. And just to prove how portable this is, if I remember, I'm not going to rebuild my project in between when I deploy it on Fabric and Sawtooth. I'm going to just deploy the same exact uh, compiled DAR file. So yeah, let's get started with this. All right. So first thing I need is Daml on Fabric, which is a Daml driver. And what we mean by the term Daml driver is that this is essentially the layer of our Daml application, or really our Daml tech stack, not part of the application, that uh, is responsible for writing and reading data from our Fabric instance. So we're going to start up a Fabric instance. Then we're going to connect our Daml driver to it. And then uh, to that, we'll connect uh, the Daml JSON API. And so the way it'll work is we'll have our front end application talking to our JSON API, or it could even talk to another API, but um, a more advanced one that I won't be covering today. And after it talks to the JSON API, the JSON API will talk to the Daml driver, which will be responsible for making sure the right data is written and and retrieved from the, our Fabric instance. So that's kind of the architecture, and that's also how we get this portability, because in every single case, you're starting up a Daml driver that actually talks to the chain and records data there. You, the trade-off here to keep in mind is that you don't get a, you don't get to actually manage the transactions directly on your Fabric instance. Uh, you couldn't write some chain code that reads and writes them. But in exchange for that, uh, you get this very portable language. And really, we should be thinking about, do we want to do that in general? Like, for example, when I write Python code, I don't worry about uh, the machine code layer of what it's running on top of. You know, I, when I write anything higher than, if you write anything higher than C or C++, you know, you generally don't concern yourself with these things. And that will generally make your life easier. You know, that's why we also write in Java and Go and all these other fun languages. So what I would do normally is I would go to wherever I was going to download it. I would install the Hyperledger Fabric tools, but I've already done that. Oh, I'm on the wrong version of the branch. Uh, I actually just updated this to Fabric 2.2 exactly for this, uh, for this meetup. We were previously on, I think, 2.1. And so you would update this, and you would go ahead and, and clone, and then you would navigate over to this directory and run a couple of commands. So let's do that. Um, it's the wrong demo. So over here, uh, we're going to just change to this directory in our demo on Fabric code. We're going to run gen.sh, which is going to generate all of our configuration data. Um, I'm not an expert on configuring Fabric servers, so uh, just take my word for it that that's what that does. And we're going to start up Fabric now with our restart Fabric command. And this is going to get going. And I think it's almost up and ready once this is done ticking by. And so that's basically it, though, for our Fabric instance. It is up and going. If you were to do this yourself when you first download it, uh, it actually would spend some time building some Docker images. So that would take a little longer on the first go. But uh, I already did that since I don't want to wait the five or so minutes that, while it being a fairly short amount of time in general, is a fairly long amount of time when we're talking, uh, presenting online. And so, yeah, our Fabric instance is up and ready to go. So, what I opened up over here is our deployment guide. Uh, to, that I wrote previously. It basically shows how to deploy one of our example applications on Daml on Fabric. I'll be showing you a different application, but let's just follow through for the steps. OK, so first step is going to be building our Daml app. And in that case, I'm going to be using OBeer, which is a really small little app for owing your friends and enemies beers. 
And so just two simple commands would be, I've already git clone this, so we'll go ahead and do daml build from our OVR directory. And all this stuff is open source online. This is actually BSD0, uh, our fabric and Sawtooth daml drivers are Apache 2. So if you want to check those out, feel free. And then we're going to run daml code gen JS. And what this will do is it'll actually go ahead and look at our model and uh, generate a lot of nice JavaScript code for you. And while I say that, I just remember that I haven't actually shown you the code yet that we'll be deploying. So let me hop over there first. Um, actually, I'll show you this after we deploy the first one so I don't interrupt the stream too much. OK, so over here, what we're going to do now is we need to start up. Uh, let's see, we've cloned our demo on Fabric instance already, and we've built our application. And now we're going to start up our demo driver. So this command with SBT here will actually start up the demo driver. And that'll take a second. And so, yeah, if anybody has any questions at any point, feel free, feel free to ch chime in. And uh, this will take a moment anyway to get started. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, when you start the Fabric network, um, then uh, we started with a Docker Compose file, and then we have to we, we need a channel. So how we can uh, choose the right channel? Um, I think right now by default, this uh, code chooses a channel for itself. But the way you would do it is somewhere in the demo driver. I think that's a great question. I just don't know the exact exact answer. I think right now what it does is it chooses a, a free channel, basically. Mm -hmm. So you use this we start uh, uh, network script. Maybe in this script there is because we have to. Uh, and then the next question is, um, do I need a, a chain code for this? So I need a, I've seen the, the Genesis block is created through your script. And then mm -hmm. we, we need uh, some. Um, yeah, a channel and the chain code to run this mm -hmm. to run Fabric. So, and then your con your driver connects to Fabric. So, what is the point where we where the connection starts? Uh, yeah, for the the chain code itself, basically, our demo driver has some custom chain code that basically, when you we start up Fabric over here, it starts the Fabric network, it sets up the channels and peers, and it deploys our custom chain code to that Fabric instance. And then that chain code is basically going to be used for communication between our DAML driver and the Fabric instance for uh, managing the data, for basically reading and writing to the chain. OK, so that means that I need a Fabric network. So I can, I can uh, make a Docker Compose file with my Fabric mm -hmm. network. And then, uh, then I start your script, and with the script, the genesis block for the, for this network is created, and uh, also a channel is created with a default name, and then uh, your script uh, creates a custom chain code, which will mm -hmm. be installed also uh, on this custom channel, and uh, this is the way. And, and this is the way how this works. So we don't have to create a chain code. Uh, the only thing what we have to do is to, to set up a basic uh, network, like the test network, for example, from the mm -hmm. favorite samples. And, uh, and the rest come from your script. From yeah, your exactly. From your script. OK. Yes. And this script actually, too, even starts up its own fabric test network. Mm -hmm. So basically, from reading the, the code behind this demo driver, you can see where and how it does all of that. OK, thank you. Cool, welcome. All right, so now we've got our driver set up. And so now what we need to do is we need to go ahead and deploy our code. All right, and deployment is going to be the same regardless of 
where we're running our demo code. So now from this step forward, it's basically identical, except ports are going to change depending on um, how the demo driver is configured. So over here, we have to run demo deploy. And that's going to set up some parties and also compile uh, our DAR again and deploy it to, to the demo driver. And you can actually see that here. The demo driver is going ahead and writing code to the Fabric network, and the Fabric network is acknowledging and receiving it. And so now our code is actually live and running on it. And the next thing to do is to get our JSON API set up. So here we'll just run our demo JSON API command, which supports 6865 and gives us uh, port 7575 as our REST API, basically. And now the final step here will be setting up our ledger. So talking to all ledgers is very similar. The only real thing you need to be concerned about is kind of um, how do we authenticate with the ledger, which will vary depending on the ledger um, in that uh, whichever authentication method, methods Fabric accepts will basically just be passed through uh, by the JSON API. But anyway, um, over here, one thing we do need to do, though, is that our demo ledger uh, slash driver cares about the name of the ledger ID. So in this case, for the Fabric one, it's Fabric-Ledger. So I'm going to head over into my UI folder. And I'm just going to set an environment, environment variables that talks to the Fabric ledger. And then I just have to go ahead and start my UI. And actually, this, this is written against React, but you can use, obviously, any front end you want with our uh, JavaScript libraries and the code jet and the generated JavaScript code. So I'm actually using Vue, which is why the command is just slightly different. And then we can go ahead and log in and do everything. But first, before we do that, I kind of want to talk about the code a bit, just to you know, explain kind of what it's doing and how Daml uh, manages to get all this set up on the back end without having to write too much. So what we have here are basically two templates. And in, in Daml, even though it's not exactly the same, you can think of a template as a class. It's basically some, something that's sitting around waiting to get instantiated into a contract, which you could also think about as akin to an, ins an instance of a class in an imperative language. And so here we have two of them, uh, beer proposal and beer down here. And basically, we, we need both of these because one thing that Daml does is it requires us to think about our responsibilities and obligations to other parties on the network and to be very explicit about them. Uh, and this is actually one of the things where if you were to try this out, it might cause a little bit of hang up because uh, probably less so for people used to distributed ledgers, but something I see sometimes is that a lot of people are just used to creating obligations between people or between parties without those parties having explicitly uh, presented it. So for example, you can kind of, and this is why it's used a lot in financial applications and healthcare and other things where you want a very strong uh, chain of guarantees of who's agreed to what when. But if you think about it, almost any program we write is kind of like that. So for example, if you were to want to send out a tweet you know, you might type up your tweet and send it to Twitter, and then Twitter would, you know, accept your tweet and post it to your timeline and share it on all your friends' news feeds. And really, in all of that, uh, there's no cryptographic or other guarantee there that you've ever asked Twitter to do any of this. And there's also no cryptographic guarantee there that Twitter is going to do any of this. And so 
what you get here when you're being very explicit, and that's why it's important in, in DAML is that you do get these guarantees that yes, I did ask Twitter to, and Twitter either said yes or no, and no, I did not actually write that tweet and Twitter, somebody you know edited the database. Um, not saying that's going to happen with Twitter, but just as an example, like there is a common thread with current day applications that a lot of your users and your partners working with you really don't have any, any say over the process. And then it leads to these very, uh, particularly in the enterprise space, a lot of very costly and ongoing um, settlement and reconciliation type of situations where uh, a lot where parties have to come together and figure out which data belongs where and who actually did what when. And so here we're trying to avoid that. So that's why this is going to be structured like that, my rather long-winded explanation of it. Anyway, so here are our proposals. What we're going to do first is we're going to basically make an offer of, to owe somebody a beer. So for example, I see Bart's uh, join the call. So if I were to offer Bart a beer, um, I would basically say, okay, here's the proposal with the beer that's encapsulated. So this beer here will be, will represent the same type of data that's in the template down here. And then we have our read and write permissions. So what we can see is if I were to want to owe Bart a beer, I would create this contract and I would be the signatory, the person who's giving the beer and Bart would be the observer, the recipient, the person who's receiving it. And with the signatory designation, Basically, I am saying that I am the one who has the ability to create this proposal. And I'm saying the recipient is the one who has the ability to see or read this proposal. So there we have our write and read permissions. Uh, we have ensure that can also assure certain preconditions such that one person can't owe the other person uh, the spear. And also with these two constructs, um, we get this very good thing where even though you know Bart and I know each other from the demo forums and we trust each other, I could never create a contract that says Bart owes me is making a beer proposal to me even by accident because demo is guaranteeing that uh, only the signatory is the one listed. So I can't sign for Bart because I, I wouldn't be Bart's party on the ledger. And then we have a bunch of execution options which are basically I, as the recipient here, the controller of the accept beer choice, can choose to accept the beer. As the controller of the reject beer choice, I could choose to reject the proposal. And Bart, as the giver, can choose to, as long as I haven't accepted it yet, to cancel the offer. And so the way all of these choices work is that they are consuming choices. And that's very much akin to a UTXO model. It really is a UTXO model as far as demo is concerned, where when you exercise a choice on a contract, you immediately archive that contract and either replace it with a new one or produce other contracts or replace it with nothing, in which case it just gets archived. So then you have this state where everything is immediately, um, and it, it's guaranteed to not, be called multiple times. So I wouldn't be able to, no matter how quick I was, no matter how close to the server I was, I wouldn't be able to call Bart's accept beer choice or Bart wouldn't be able to call my accept beer choice multiple times. He would just be able to call it once because immediately and atomically when this beer is created here, uh, this template itself actually gets archived. We do have non-consuming choices where that doesn't happen. But one nice thing here is that this makes sure that if two transactions conflict, you know, you're not going to encounter the double spend issue uh, because it is intrinsic to DAML. And then down here, we have the actual beer, which will be instantiated once uh, this is accepted. And then we can see we have our giver and recipient parties, which we had referred to up here. And now we both can actually write to the contract because also these permissions are transient. So when Bart provide, 
when I provide my signature up here, uh, that is basically a permission that for all child contracts spawns from this contract are going to carry over with my signature. And then Bart, since he's chosen to accept it, which creates the beer, can go ahead and be the second signatory on the contract. So now we both have had guaranteed permission to produce this bit of state on our ledger. Uh, we can again ensure that giver and recipient are not the same. This actually, I probably don't need this one up here uh, now that I think about it because this one down here will actually ensure the preconditions as well. It just helps that um, you can't create an invalid proposal that somebody could agree to and then result in something that can't be created later. And then, yeah, ultimately, right down here, I can then whenever I give Bart the beer, Bart can go ahead and say, okay, I've received that. And so really too, a lot of these functions that have pure can mostly just uh, be considered helper functions when, when the signatory is already there. They're not really necessarily needed because archiving a contract is a choice that every contract has. But this makes our code a little, a little nicer in appearance and a little easier to understand our intention behind it. So that's the code. And I know I talked a lot about these few lines of code, uh, but it does encapsulate quite a lot of logic. And one thing I should mention here is that when it comes to uh, the declarations at the start, the with declarations, you can kind of consider these as kind of uh, columns in a SQL table and the templates would be the actual tables that get updated atomically. So whenever you, whenever they change, you know, they get swapped out and, and overridden. So anyway, we're going to log in now and we're going to go ahead and log in as Alice, which is one of the parties on the ledger. And we're going to offer a beer to Bob. And then we're going to also offer a beer to Carol. And so now we can see that we've done our beer proposal over here. And basically, Bob and Carol are going to have the options to accept beer or reject beer. And also, they're not going to be able to see each other's transactions because uh, in one, we have Alice and Bob as the giver and recipient. And the other, we have Alice and Carol as the giver and recipient. So we'll go ahead and log in as Bob. And here we go and can see that Alice has offered it and Bob is going to go ahead and accept, uh, which would correspond to this choice here. So then that choice will go ahead and instantiate our template down here. And Bob will, being the recipient, will have the ability to mark this as received. So Alice gives Bob the beer and Bob goes ahead and says it's been received. And then it gets archived away. And then Carol, same thing here. Uh, but Carol doesn't want the beer offer, so Carol can go ahead and choose to reject it. And that'll just go ahead and archive that proposal. And now it's, it's no more and can't be interacted with. And so, yeah, that's basically the program and how we would deploy to Fabric and get everything up and running. But now I'm actually going to go ahead and do the same thing with Sawtooth. And so let me just take down all my services. Always good to take that down in order from the top of the stack down to the bottom uh, so they don't start erroring out. And yeah, OK, so that's done. And now we're going to go ahead with uh, and check out demo on Sawtooth. And this was actually produced by uh, Blockchain Technology Partners, which is one of our partners. Uh, they made the demo on Sawtooth, demo driver, and also uh, open sourced it. So I think that's really great. Um, it's really always nice to see, you know, people building on top of open source projects that uh, they may not they work they work with themselves, uh, they use themselves, but that they may not you know be as direct as Digital Asset. It's just good to see that you know our ecosystem there has these contributors. So I really, really just appreciate uh, these contributions very, very much because I think that open source is basically the lifeblood of any good long-term lasting project.
But anyway, what we would do with Damwon Sawtooth is we would of course go ahead and check it out with a git clone and we would also build it uh, in much the same way that when you do to the demo on Fabric one, if I had done this uh, completely live, it would have spent about five minutes building. We're going to kind of though skip that, though we do need this isolation ID just because it would take a few minutes and then that would just be kind of a waste of time. Um, but anyway, go over here, set this, which needs to start up. And one other small thing to keep in mind for this particular demo driver is that this command here that's going to start everything up will also start up the demo driver itself. So just uh, as unlike before where I started up the demo driver separately, this script just starts up the demo driver together with the instance. Um, that's just something to keep in mind. It obviously can change because this is an open source project. So if you're checking it out though, just don't be confused. It just starts up everything together and then runs it on port 9000. This is gonna take a moment to get started up. So yeah, if anybody else has any questions during, you know, you can feel free, feel free to ask, but yeah, it'll just take a minute. Um, could, could you give us a, a path when somebody wants to start with Dammer? What is the first step and uh, do you have a, a learning path for a beginner, for a Dammer debate beginner? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So one part of our learning path, especially if you're a beginner and you want to understand them a little bit, because it does take just a little bit to wrap your head around, uh, we have our demo.com slash learn page. And so basically what that is, is a bunch of in-browser examples that will actually execute on a remote Linux server somewhere and allow you to just basically walk through all the steps of learning Daml and getting started with it. So for example, over here, if you wanted to walk, run through this deployment again without watching this video, you can go to deploying Daml on production ledgers and then try it out on Fabric and on Sawtooth. And what you'll get here is basically the entire thing of, of running these. So you'll basically be stepping through this deployment guide here, uh, the pretty much the exact same thing except interactively online, and you don't even need to download anything uh, to get started. Obviously, once you want to build your demo applications, you know, you can go to our website and go ahead and, you know, click to get the SDK. Uh, this website actually will change probably in another few days. So yeah, look, look forward to the, the new styling on it. But that's what I would suggest for when you're first getting started. And then of course, when you want to learn demo in depth and you wanna to get to writing demo, we have just excellent introductions to demo. This in particular, uh, under writing demo and introduction to demo is basically how I personally learned to write demo. And I can tell you from my own experience, I am somebody who has tried many, many times to learn a functional programming language and not ever got too far. And this actually taught me basically all I needed to know in order to, to write demo. But of course, uh, when you get to the more, while you're going through this journey, you're going to have questions. So we also have our forum and it's a very actively trafficked forum that uh, you, know, you can go ahead, join, ask your questions. If you spend more than five minutes on the docs or demo.com slash learn, really just come over to discuss.daml.com and go ahead, hop over to the questions category and make a new topic. And so, um, you know, I could actually say, uh, how does demo on fabric choose a channel uh, on my 
fabric instance, like uh, like Roland had asked before. So I'll just give it a little demo on fabric tag. Um, And I'm sure within the next couple hours, and oftentimes even faster, somebody's going to answer that. Um, anyway, <laughs> so we'll we'll get we'll get our answer for for sure from people who work much much more directly on these particular components, Roland. Okay, I will watch it. <laughs> okay, great. And yeah, so I think we're we should probably be started up now. These windows open anymore. And yeah, okay. Uh, we've definitely started up. We can see here that we have our demo driver running on port 9000, sometimes also called demo RPC. So we won't be able, we will need to, to start that ourselves. And like I said before, um, I'm going to avoid recompiling the code. Um, I kind of misspoke because demo deploy actually recompiles the code whether I want to or not. Uh, but it is the same exact code being compiled down to the same exact dar file. Oh, and just uh, FYI, dar files. Oh, I'm deploying to the wrong port. So that's why we timed out because this one's running on port 9000. Dar files uh, are basically the same as jar files in that they are demo compiled down to an intermediary language called demo LF that you know, you don't need to know it yourself. The compiler just makes it for you. Um, and then basically zipped up in the same way a jar file is with all its dependencies there uh, in a single self-contained executable for deployment. And then we're going to start up the JSON API. Again, we're going to talk to our port 9000. And it'll get started. And then basically just like, oh, I need, I do need to change the environment variable though, because over here, where is it? Okay, I can't see where it is in the output. It's probably over here somewhere in the output. But anyway, uh, this one too calls its ledger by something else. Just update. That and then go ahead and yarn serve again. And so now, without you know changing a single line of code, just with changing the the, the infrastructure, we can have the same code running on a completely different type of infrastructure. In this case, being Sawtooth. So we'll go ahead and log in. Maybe this time we'll log in as Bob. And Bob will offer a beer to Alice. The first time you do this, you run something on Sawtooth. I think it does some just-in-time comp compilation, so it does take a moment. Uh, but then after that, it's, it speeds up quite a bit. Do the same for Carol. And then just like last time, you know, Alice can go ahead and log in and choose to accept or reject, and then you know, Carol could have done the same thing as well. So yeah, that's most of my uh, presentation. The one other thing is that if you want to follow any of the links um, that I showed before, you can get started with discuss.daml.com slash start. And that'll take you just to a post that has basically everywhere that you would want to look to learn demo and to understand it. I recommend really demo.com slash learn, learn first. And then uh, if you're interested further, go ahead to docs.demo.com and always come by the forum for to ask questions. Uh, we're all very friendly there and our engineers particularly love the forum. So they're always, always on it. And also, you know, if you need any of these useful links, you can go ahead and click on this little icon up here and check out uh, all the useful links that give you much more information about demo and kind of how our community is. And yeah, so that's my presentation. Thank, and thank you very much for having me. If there's any questions, I'm more than happy to, to answer them. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Antonio, for this great presentation and introduction. Um, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, this is Daniel. Hi, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for the hi. great presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, I would ask what's, what's the public key infrastructure model behind, behind Demul? So how are, how are transactions signed? And mm -hmm. if that is somehow integrated into the, into the public key infrastructure of Hyperledger Fabric? Yes, so uh, the public key infrastructure, and we do have some blog posts on that as well. Um, I'll try to pull one up here as I'm talking, but basically Daml intends to not have any opinions on that infrastructure. Instead, what it does is it, um, it basically relies on the public key infrastructure that you, that's already existing within your enterprise. And so whatever PKI you're using, it can just, it can handle. And Edward actually, uh, I'll share this link in the chat, goes into how that works in much more detail than, than I can explain because that is definitely uh, beyond my, my knowledge of, of these things. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Any other question? So I have to ask one question to Fabric, um, mm -hmm. or I would like to ask. So in Fabric, we can use a different uh, uh, world state. So we can use LevelDB or CouchDB. But uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned that uh, Dammel uh, used the infrastructure from uh, Fabric. And uh, that would mean that I can use um, CouchDB database as a world state or, or also LevelDB if I would like to do this. Is this correct? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah, there's no, um, anything that, that Fabric uses on its back end is completely up to it. Mm -hmm. XAML doesn't really have opinions on the infrastructure of your application. It means that I need only and uh, I need only the um, public keys or the crypto material from Fabric CA, for example, only mm -hmm. for the for peer for for the peer communication for Ottawa, uh, not for the users. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So Alice so. and Bob, in your example, why do you create Alice and Bob in your example? Oh, so. Uh, all parties on demo ledgers are created explicitly. So with that, that happens with deployment. So over, actually it'll be nicer to look at in Visual Studio. Um, over here we have parties that are declared. Uh, and basically when it goes to deploy, these parties are created. But there, the other ways you would do it are uh, there's a way to create parties over the JSON API endpoint, and then there's a way to create parties explicitly on the command line uh, using like a demo ledger. I think it's like allocate parties or something like that. And basically, that's those are the various ways that parties are created uh, in demo. So you can actually go ahead and, and create parties and associate them with whatever. Um, whatever kind of crypt cryptographic data you want. Okay, so that means that uh, these, these parties are, are not created in the Fabric network. These parties are created in the DAMA system. Uh, yes, I believe so, but there's also a lot of active development going on around that. Uh, one of the very interesting things that is still being produced um, Canton, which basically manages a lot of the party creation and uh, actually intercommunication between even disparate ledgers. So like having Fabric talk to Sawtooth. And so some of these things, um, it's a rather technical question, uh, but some of these things will, would basically, they might change and uh, they might also start, you know, referring to. Actually, you should probably ask that on the forum because I don't. I don't think I can, yeah, okay, can no, answer no, that no. accurately enough. So uh, another question, maybe. So in your template, you have a beer. 
Mm-hmm. So can I set up more properties for a beer? Uh, yes, you can definitely set up more peer properties. Let me close this folder. Open up the demo on Fabric one. Let's see where. Gen.sh takes in a bunch of the fig data from up over here. So over here is basically you can configure your your fabric servers however however you want. It takes the same exact configurations. Really, it's just all wrapped up in a nice, easy to deploy commands. But mm-hmm. yeah, everything's in here. Okay. No, oh, good. So and here we have the config.txt YAML file, and with this config.txt YAML file, we can uh, configure mm-hmm. the, cha- the channel. And uh, yeah, and with crypto config, so all crypto material here is with is created with config.tx because mm-hmm. we have a crypto config YAML file here. Yeah. For the crypto material. And here we can see that's a fabric two point. Uh, 2.2 point, 2 point two, uh, mm-hmm. version because of the uh, configuration here. Okay, so any other question? Uh, yeah, perhaps I would have one more question from my side. Uh, mm-hmm. And the question is how much we can integrate a uh, demo uh, on Fabric with like private data collection? Mm-hmm. Um, what do you mean by private data collection? So there's a special construct in Hyperledger Fabric. It's called private data collection. It looks mm-hmm. like that way that your that your data is not written into the ledger, uh, but basically only the hash of your data is written to the ledger, and you can control that your data uh, is basically propagated on a on a different uh, gossip network. But again, so the main main idea is that your data is not in the ledger, just the hash of your data. Oh, okay. Uh, and the, and yeah. the content of the data is written in the site database. And mm-hmm. the advantage of this approach is that you can um, delete this data set, for example. Um, and uh, that means that when we delete this private data set, then we can delete this only in the site, in the site database. And uh, in the, on the ledger, in the channel, uh, is only the hash of this data set. So nobody can read this hash. So, but and only allowed organizations can uh, mm-hmm. read uh, or write this uh, data set in the site, in this private private collection. This is called private collection. And this is a way to um, be a little bit more GDPR compliant. So when we have uh, sensitive information like personal information, then we can use this kind of technique. Uh, to store personal information into a blockchain, so-called blockchain, and uh, later we can delete this uh, from the blockchain system. And uh, in other system, in, in, in other systems uh, with uh, other um, architecture, that wouldn't be possible. So, and this is a great advantage from from Fabric that we can delete data. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, and that's the question I think Daniel uh, would like to ask, how we can integrate this when we deal, for example, with, with sensitive data, uh, personal uh, person data, because in the Europe, so we have a problem with uh, the GDPR, so, and we must uh, take care on this topic. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, for this particular driver, the way it's written right now, I don't believe it uses any of the any of those privacy features, but what I can tell you is that GDPR is a major concern of digital asset too, and it is being worked on to make sure that when the various infrastructures we're using offer these abilities, that it'll be able to you know to be done. So that um, you know, demo actually in and of itself does have these abilities to have kind of sub sub transaction privacy and to not write things to the ledger sometimes if uh, a bunch of steps can essentially occur kind of off chain 
and then these features are going to be better integrated with uh, the, the various infrastructure options. And that's kind of also part of where Canton comes in because Canton's something that uh, allows for this, this similar type of thing where you, know, you can have not every bit of data stored on, on nodes and it can uh, eventually be deleted and pruned. And pruning is a huge uh, thing that they're working on and also be GDPR compliant because yeah, that's something that uh, I think all these things face right now, but we're definitely, definitely working on it. Okay. And then ju just one more question. You mentioned like transaction privacy. Um, mm -hmm. so, so what do you mean by that? I mean, we usually have the problem is that, I mean, in Fabric, you have some kind of a transaction privacy, but there's no privacy in terms of encryption. So if you have practically a database administrator, your database administrator can log into the, to the couch DB, for instance, or level DB, or to the ports and container and can reload the data, even if there's some kind of a read access in Hyperledger Fabric. So, so do you have something in terms of uh, better or integrated in terms of, of transaction privacy? Yes, yeah, so what I was referring to there, well, I was kind of referring to two things, is Daml has this notion of sub-transaction privacy, which is essentially if, uh, for example, you and I had a variety of contracts that we had to fill out between each other, um, and we had like kind of a starting state and ending state, we could kind of, and I don't know the, the technical details of this, but for, some of those things, if they just required both of our signatures at the end, we could sign them and produce some other contract uh, without storing all the intermediary steps in between on the ledger. Like we didn't need to store every single, okay. every single part of, of a transaction. We could just store essentially the resulting state uh, as long as we've all signed off on it, uh, thanks to having signatories. And then the other thing there is that demos other current method of privacy is it only shares data as far as it needs to go. Um, I know some infrastructures replicate all data across all nodes, but if you have infrastructures that don't replicate all data across all nodes, and you and I, for example, are parties on, on node A, and uh, we have a contract that um, Roland, if Roland's on node B and part of the same network, Roland actually won't see that contract because it'll never be shared to Roland unless Roland needs to be involved in it. Uh, so we get privacy in that way, but we don't currently have uh, enough privacy um, to actually delete data yet or to encrypt it so people can can retroactively read it. But we are working on these things. Okay, cool, cool, thanks. Welcome. Okay, uh, any final awesome. question out there? So if not, then I think we are great in time. Um, thank you so much, Antonio, for this presentation and for your time uh, spending with us. And uh, yeah, I hope uh, we will see us uh, in nature, in person, uh, when you come to Switzerland, <laughs> the, the company in Switzerland. And uh, yeah, so. Um, yeah, awesome, that, I would be very happy to. Yeah, so, okay, then uh, thanks for all participants uh, to take part of this session today. And um, on the next session, uh, we will uh, see a um, nice session about the uh, chain code uh, test environment. So I will provide the session uh, in this way. And uh, yeah, so this was from my side and uh, stay safe and uh, we see us next time. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye.